Good day, grade tens. In this lesson, we are going to learn about the characteristics of waves, and we are going to join Mr. Fullerton as he teaches us all about this. Hi everyone, I'm Mr. Fullerton, and today I'd like to talk to you about characteristics of waves. Our objectives are going to be to define terms used to describe periodic waves, terms like wave speed, wave velocity, wavelength, frequency, even period of a wave. We'll also determine whether points on consecutive waves are in phase or not. So let's start off by looking at a transverse wave. And if you recall, a transverse wave is a wave in which the direction of the wave's velocity is perpendicular to the direction of the movement of the particles of the wave. So, if we have a transverse wave, we can label a number of points on the wave. The high points, or, pe or peaks, we call crests. And the tr low points we call troughs. The amplitude of a wave, which is how much energy it contains, is a measure from the baseline to the crest or the baseline to a trough. Either way, we'll label that with the capital A. So that could be the amplitude or that could be the amplitude. And it's the magnitude of the distance between the baseline and the crest or the baseline and the trough. Wavelength is the distance between the same point on two consecutive waves. So a wavelength could be measured from crest to crest. That distance. And we'll label that with the Greek letter lambda. L-A-M-B-D-A, if we want to write that in English. The lowercase lambda tells us the wavelength. The different, the distance between two points the same point on consecutive waves. Now, period is the amount of time it takes for one wave to go by. So pick a point in space, the time it takes for one complete wavelength to pass is the period. We call that capital T. And you may recall that from mechanics, where that was the time for one complete cycle or one complete revolution when we were talking about circular motion. And frequency, then, is one over the period, which is the number of waves that pass a given point in one second. And period, likewise, is one over frequency. So we can use these different items to help us characterize waves. I'd also like to point out something called wave phase. If you have the same point on two consecutive waves, those points are said to be in phase. They're 360 degrees apart if you consider one entire wave revolution 360 degrees, or 2 pi if you want to do it in radians. So those two red points would be in phase. If you wanted to be exactly 180 degrees out of phase, you'd go halfway between the two. So I'm going to put a red X here. That point would be 180 degrees out of phase with our initial point up there. So in phase means the same point on a different wave. Out of phase, not the same point. And if it's 180 degrees out of phase, it's exactly between those two points. Let's continue on here and see what we can do with this. As we look at longitudinal waves, that means the wave velocity is in one direction and the particles of the wave vibrate in that same plane, parallel to the direction of the wave velocity. We can label the parts on a longitudinal wave as well. Areas of very high density we call compressions. And areas of low density we call rarefactions. Amplitude, again, is related to the energy of the wave. The more amplitude, the more energy there is in the wave. And in this case, it has to do with how dense the compressions are and how non-dense or less dense the rarefactions are. Wavelength, we measure the same way. Take the same point on consecutive waves. So we could go from compression to compression in order to find our wavelength. Or you could go from rarefaction to rarefaction. And frequency and period apply here just as they did when we talked about transverse waves. So, sample question one. The diagram represents a transverse wave. The wavelength of the wave is equal to the distance between which points? It means we have to find the same point on consecutive waves. If I look at A, I can see the same point over here at E. So the distance between A and E would give us a wavelength. I 
also see here if we start at B, we have the same point on a consecutive wave there at F. So B and F should work. Or if I start at C, the distance between C and G is the distance between the same point on consecutive waves. So I agree to see three sets of points you can use to determine the wavelength here. Here we have a periodic wave. Which point on the wave is in phase with point P? That means we have to find the same point on another wave. Well, P is on the rise right as it crosses the baseline. So I see that again over here at C. So I would say that point C is in phase with point P. If we wanted to go 180 degrees out of phase, we'd have to go over here to B directly between them. Let's take a look at another one. The diagram below represents a transverse wave moving on a uniform rope with point A labeled. On the diagram, make an X at the point on the wave that is 180 degrees out of phase with point A. Well, let's start. If that's A, it's about halfway up the rise of a wave. Let's find the next point that is in phase. That would be over there. So if I want to find the point that is 180 degrees out of phase, I'm going to go directly between those two. And about halfway in between looks like it'd be right about there. 180 degrees out of phase with point A. Question four, the distance between which two points on the transverse wave identifies the amplitude of the wave? Well, if you'll recall, the amplitude of the wave is the distance from the baseline to a crest or the baseline to a trough. So our choices between A and B, no, that doesn't work. Those are on the baseline. Between A and C, those are also on the baseline. A and E, uh, there's the distance between a baseline and a trough. So that should work. There's our amplitude. And choice four, D and E, well, that's from a crest to a trough, so that would be two times the amplitude. That can't be the answer. The correct answer must be three, A and E. A periodic wave is produced by a vibrating tuning fork. The amplitude of the wave would be greater if the tuning fork were struck more softly, struck harder, replaced by a lower frequency tuning fork, or replaced by a higher frequency tuning fork. It's interesting here, in this problem, they talk about lower and higher frequencies. Note that when you hear a sound wave, higher frequency corresponds to a higher pitch. Lower frequency corresponds to a lower pitch. That's not going to help us, though. If we want the amplitude to be greater, we need to put more energy in it. We get more energy, more loudness, by striking it harder. So the correct answer must be two. Let's try one last sample problem. A longitudinal wave moves to the right through a uniform medium. Points A, B, C, D, and E represent the positions of particles of the medium. What is the direction of the motion of the particles at position C as the wave moves to the right? Well, if the wave's moving to the right, that means the particles in the wave must vibrate in the same plane, left and right. So, as the wave moves to the right, C must move to the right and to the left. Between which two points on the wave could you measure a complete wavelength? Well, I could measure a complete wavelength by taking the same point on two consecutive waves. In this case, that must be between point A and point C. Those look like the same point on consecutive waves. So that would be our wavelength between A and C. Hopefully this will get you started. If you need more help, visit aplusphysics.com or feel free to check out the two review books, Regents Physics Essentials for students in New York Regents classes or Honors Physics Essentials, really written for everyone else in an... You will agree that Mr. Fullerton basically covered all the characteristics of waves for us. Thank you, grade 10s, and have a wonderful day.